It's great to be back. Uh, most of you have probably heard me before because I've been coming here for about 20 years now. Um, so I think that, that's how long the partnership goes back, 20 years. But for those who don't, literally just a couple of pictures to kick off to give a bit, give a bit of context. So hopefully they, that's where I spent 20 years of my life. So now I live in Bath. I was thinking Bath, Cheltenham, they're very similar, aren't they, sort of? Is Bath nice and Cheltenham? Is Cheltenham nice and Bath? Uh, uh, but anyway, so it couldn't be more different. So 20 years in that hell of a mess. I mean, literally, the latest stats are that Burundi is the hungriest country in the world. It's the poorest country in the world. So right at the bottom pile, now trying to live out my discipleship in one of the nicest places in the world. And that's a real challenge. But next picture. Um, and it's, this is about the most exciting two-week period of my year, because right now in Burundi, we have 847 evangelists out in the bush in 46 maybe different communities, and they are out there sharing Christ for two weeks. So this is the end of the first week. In the first week, they've led 5,800 and something people to the Lord. Uh, there have been lots of, lots of different demons. So, uh, de so this, we've done this for 17 years. We've seen 180,000 people come to Jesus through this outreach. With all sort of apostolic miracles, casting out demons, healing the sick, getting beaten up. There's a witch doctor burning his child publicly, having been slain in the spirit when our guys showed up. They, said, they spoke, he fell down. He said, uh, come back two days they came out two days later, he'd assembled the whole village at the preaching of the gospel, him burning his chance publicly, submitting to the highest power. He and 50 people in that village gave their lives to Christ. Next one. Uh, so this is Louis. So I, I cycled past his village. I was, uh, Louis, this is just a couple of months ago. Um, and uh, so Louis, two years ago, he was blind. What I love about stories is you can't deny stories, can you? So two years ago, he was blind. He was a proper loser because he was a widower and he was, his kids had abandoned him. So he's on the street begging, total loser. And he came on one of our outreaches, desperate, and he was prayed for. He was prayed for, and he was healed. And so his kids have come to faith, obviously seeing that miracle. Uh, we gave him last Christmas, we gave him a bunch of pigs to start up a sort of mini business going. He's found some wrinkly old babe to get married to. He is a happy man. He's a happy man. The gospel changes everything. Next one. You've got this girl. This is a modern day version of the, in the Bible. You know about that lady who was bleeding and was desperate because she was an outcast. She had lost everything. So she reached out through the crowd and touched Jesus. Well, this is, this is a modern day version. This lady... She couldn't obviously touch, touch Jesus in the flesh, but by the spirit she could. She was desperate. She came on, on one of our outreaches again. Her husband had left because he couldn't have sex with her anymore. So she was, she, again, she was in a really bad state. And, and she reached out in desperation, and the Holy Spirit met with her. She was healed. And I don't know how you know that, but she knew that. She rushed home. Her husband had gone to take another woman so that he could have sex. And she said, you're coming back with me, baby. And uh, they're now back together. They're back together. He's given his life to, to the Lord. The gospel changes everything. Last story. And this is uh, Eno Sansa. He's one of our star young leaders out there. So basically, we just identify, empower, and equip the best local leaders of passion, integrity, gifting, and vision for the transformation nation, bottom up and top down. So that's what Glow does. Our charity been doing that for 20 years. Seen unbelievable stuff, still in a horrific context. But look at Skinny Waffer. Um, Eno's not there. So we went like that, basically, to, to highlight. I mean, he's one of the skinniest people I know but he is healthy. He's skinny because he's so hungry for God. And he fasts loads. And he's got the gift of healing. And it was one of these previous years of doing this outreach that he'd, he'd done the Sunday service with his team. And these two mute ladies came and said, you know, can you, can you pray, for, pray for us? So he, he left his team. He said, you guys currently do. He took them around the side uh, into, a, into a side room, and he said, I, God, I am willing to pray for three days and not leave this room if you will, if you will only release these ladies from the shackle, uh, shackles of not being able to speak. And he started praying for her in his desperation. Now, it didn't take two, three days. It took 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, ah, they started sort of weeping and laughing, and, and he took them out. Now, the church choir, the sort of worship band equivalent, they were having a practice there right there and then, and he interrupted the church the choir in their practice. He said, hey, guys, I've got you two new members of the choir. And they were like, well, that is a sick joke. That's not funny at all. We know those ladies. And he said to the ladies, you've got anything to say? La! They sang. And the guys fell on their knees weeping at seeing the power of God. Now, I share those stories because I hope it stirs faith. Some of you, you're still cynical. And that's because we come from a very cynical nation, don't we? And we find it hard to believe that. Oh, God. Help me overcome my unbelief. Anyway, that's going on right now. We've got another week of it. I'd love you to pray. Nick, my buddy Nick's going to get those, those, those forms. Have you already put them out? Uh, so listen, a lot of you already signed up on this. There's only one in each row coming, coming around. If you already signed up, don't sign up again. Uh, if you uh, get too many emails, don't sign up again. But there's one in each row, literally. And uh, so basically, it just means you'll get these stories, and it'll stir faith. That's the point. And 
basically, our, our work is so fruitful because people pray. So pass it on or sign up, and that'd be brilliant. So that is pretty much it. And then I'd love just to say I've got a few books here, which, again, many of you have read. That's a daily devotional shot in the arm for radical all-in discipleship. That's my heartbeat. So that's a daily uh, reading, and that is basically more than conquerors, a call to radical discipleship. So if you want to grab those afterwards, that'll be at the back. That's all preamble. Now you know where I'm coming from. Ready? Gear shift. Gear shift. And uh, titles. You want a title for the talk? It's a weird title. Are you salty? Are you shiny? That's the title. Are you salty? Are you shiny? Weird questions. You'll work out where I'm coming from. Now, after the Second World War, with all that was going on, and hopefully, hopefully to control and eventually wipe out Christianity in Romania, the, the, the communists, they confiscated church property. They forbade ministers to work without licenses from the government. Soon after taking over power, they convened a congress of all the Christian bodies, be they um, Catholics, Orthodox, or Protestants, and they drew together 4,000 priests and bishops and ministers, and they assembled in the Great Hall of the Parliament Building before a massive portrait of Stalin, who was the Russian dictator. And under fear of imprisonment, torture and death, one Christian leader after another stepped forward and praised this new communist government, declaring that communism and Christianity were entirely compatible, that they had similar goals and uh, could coexist. And sitting, I don't know how you would have responded. I, th I suspect all of us, think, this is, there's something seriously wrong here. They're all compromising. They're all selling out. But sitting in that meeting, there was a there was a highly educated, lovely Lutheran pastor. His name was Richard Wormbrand. And next to him was his hardcore wife, Sabina. And as they listened to this distraught, as the body of Christ basically was selling out, minister after bishop after priest, she turned to him with flaming eyes and said, Richard, stand up and wash away this shame from the face of Christ. They are spitting in his face. And he whispered back to her, if I do, you will lose your husband. And she instantly replied, I don't want a coward for a husband. And so he asked permission to speak, and he was respected and well known. And as he stepped forward to the podium, this was being beamed live on national radio. He stood and looked out at those 4,000 faces, and he just said, it is our duty as ministers to glorify Christ. Boom! That was it. That led to 14 years in prison being tortured. He actually ended up uh, writing a book called Tortured for Christ. Three of those were in solitary confinement in pitch blackness without a sound for three years. He should have gone mad. He should have gone mad. And he was forced, they, they made him take communion with his own feces, they forced him to eat, you know, I mean, all sorts of unbelievable stuff, which he documents in that very stirring, very inspiring book. Uh, their son, well, the wife, Sabina, was told that he was dead, which is pretty sick, isn't it? And then she also went to prison, leaving their child, their only child, as a street child. So they suffered unbelievably for their conviction that this is worth living and dying for. They were very salty. They were very shiny. Second story. Can anyone say to me which is the, the fastest growing church in the world? Anyone know? Iran. Interesting. Fastest growing church facing masses of persecution from a very low ebb, but exploding in growth. Don't know if you've got any Iranians at your church. But there was this one particular couple, and they, in a sense, were very privileged and blessed because they managed to get out of Iran to the promised land, get to the United States. But after a few months in the United States, the wife said to her husband, darling, Take, please, take me back to Iran. There is a satanic lullaby in this nation. All the Christians are asleep, and I feel myself being lulled to sleep. <sighs> Think about that. That's the most powerful story I've heard in, uh, or read about in the last several years. Because essentially what she was saying was that she wants to leave the safety, the physical safety of America to go back to extreme danger. Plenty of Christians right now in Evin prison, women being raped, guys being tortured, being killed, with their family. She'd prefer to risk physical danger in Rwanda than spiritual danger in America. 
And she said, all the Christians are asleep. Now, we'll dispute that. We'll say not all the Christians are asleep in America or England, similar Western context, but a lot are. And she said, I've, this, this word, the satanic lullaby, I feel myself being lulled to sleep. It's such a powerful image. And I just wonder whether you can resonate with it. Are you being lulled to sleep? Have you fallen asleep? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm desperate. I'm desperate not to. Rockabye baby on the treetop. So you've got those two stories to come up. Now let's look at the scriptures. Are you salty? Are you shiny? It's Matthew 5, verse 13 and following. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So first of all, are you salty? Now, again, it's hard for us, 21st century, to really get the full depth of this picture. But Michael Yusuf writes, uh, we can't appreciate the, the value of salt in the ancient world. Roman soldiers were given their wages in salt. I don't know if you knew that. Leviticus 2.13 speaks of the Mosaic law's requirement for salt in all the grain offerings. The Greeks actually considered salt to be divine. And different theologians have taken sort of different interpretations and highlighted different attributes of salt. So its whiteness represented the purity of the holy believer. Or as salt stings and open wounds, so were Christians to sting the world with judgment and rebuke. Or as salt added flavor to a dish, so Christians were to have a positive uh, impact in their society. Or as salt creates thirst, so Jesus' people should create a spiritual longing and thirst in others around them through their attractive lifestyles. So different Areas there, but probably the main purpose of salt that Jesus was really pointing to was that it pre prevented decay. In saying, You are the salt of the earth, he's calling on his disciples, he's calling on us now to act as preservatives to stop the moral decay in our rotting culture. And they, at the time, they would have understood that. They would have understood that without refrigeration, the, 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 uh, the fish that they just caught in the Sea of Galilee would quickly, within several hours, become rotting, stinking, and worthless. However, once salted, they could be stored away safely and enjoyed at a later date. Are, we, are you with me? Now, our privilege is to act as salt, likewise. But he carries on with a warning. He says, but if salt loses its saltiness or its taste, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. Now, Jesus isn't saying you can lose your salvation, but he is saying you can lose your saltiness. When salt becomes contaminated, it's poisonous and corrosive. Contaminated salt can't even be used for fertilizer on a field. It's, it just has to be thrown out onto the road. And if you've lost your saltiness through compromise, through apathy, through indifference, Jesus' assessment is blunt and clear. And if that's the case for you this morning, whether you're here or online, right now, we need to confess and repent, and then we receive his restoration, and we get back in the game. And maybe that's you today. Are you salty? I, I, did you use, are you still salty? Did you used to be salty? Have you lost your saltiness? Do you still long to be salty? And I want to say there is hope. There is hope. And it's been easier for me to say salty living, particularly in Burundi, where you, know, you don't sign up for Burundi because you're, you, you, you're embracing comfort. You know? it, it, clearly, it was an intentional step to go to the most dangerous country in the world at the time, and people trying to kill me, and people I care about getting killed, and facing death threats, all sorts of nutty stuff. Uh, that wasn't an, a, a decision to embrace comfort, whereas many of us, either by default or certainly aspirationally as well in our culture, comfort is something to be sought after. But comfort and cross cannot coexist. Jesus says, if you will come after me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. And let's be honest. Is there any taking up of my cross 
and, follow, and following him? Well, am, I, or am, I, am I following him or am I expecting him to follow me on my terms and, and my convenience, me setting the parameters of the relationship? And because we live in a consumer culture, the, the danger is we, we can embrace a, a consumer Jesus. So the worship didn't do anything for me today. Or well, a sermon didn't hit the spot for me. It's not about you. Seriously. In 2015, so we had 10 years of peace. So I had six, seven years of war, most, when it was, it was... And then 2005, 2015, we had peace. And in the war years, I was, I was single, then I had a wife, three kids, and 2015, it kicks off. And I'm like, this is really heavy. Is my wife going to get raped? Are the kids going to get killed, traumatized? But we chose to stay because we choose faith and not fear. But it's kicking off, there's burning barricades, and, uh, and uh, when it kicked off on 29th of April, 2015, I was preaching that Sunday, so I had to go to church. Most people didn't go to church. Maybe 30 of the usual 130 of our church went. And I was looking around this grieving body. I was getting tweets coming through of dead bodies on the roads, and I had to get through burning barricades. So you can imagine, pretty full on. But I was looking around at our, our worshipping community, I was thinking, there's Ephraim, and Ephraim's five-year-old daughter is wetting herself now. Every time she hears gunfire, that's trauma. So she hears wetting herself 15 times a day, I don't know. And Desiree, who's lost his job, and, you know, how is he going to provide now for his family, six kids? And, and they, they're so traumatized. They need to get out of the country, but that's leaving everything. You know, I mean, just looking across at our broken body. And... Uh, I didn't have a, a mental breakdown, but I was kind of breaking down in a cafe, and I wrote a blog called The Curse of Comfort. And this is a little bit from that Curse of Comfort. Listen to it. There is a noble defiance in worshipping God in the midst of grim circumstances. And that is where the curse of comfort comes in. And I don't want to criticize Western Christianity, but as products of our consumer cultures, we invariably end up conforming rather than being transformed in Romans 12 speak, acting as thermometers which reflect the reality of the environment rather than thermostats which set the very temperature of the, and, in, and alter the whole environment. Thus, we often unwittingly embrace, sorry, thus we often uh, craft ourselves a more comfortable consumer cross and our worship experience can end up feeling shallow and and anemic. And it's so easy to turn to Facebook, social media in general, chocolate, TV, sex, rather than to Christ when things get rough. And it's no wonder why my most intimate corporate worship experiences in the West have been with the most obviously broken people, like tramps and alcoholics, teen challenge, drug addicts, that sort of thing, prisoners, who don't feel the, the need to maintain the facade that their lives are all in order. And God doesn't love us, sophisticated people, more than them, or them more than us. But what they do have over us is that they have been stripped of the mixed blessing or curse of comfort. And in their unpolished desperation, God is extremely close. And God was so close to us that morning. And he's so close to the suffering body in Afghanistan right now, and North Korea, and Eritrea, and Yemen, and Nigeria, and the list goes on of persecuted nations. And Burundi, it's not persecution, but it's serious suffering. And if you're going through a hell of a time this morning, he is extremely close. And don't seek comfort as the solution. It's not, Christ is. And that's why you might say, yes, yeah, Simon, my faith is shallow and anemic. It's much harder for us in the West. That's why she said, take me back to Iran. As George Bernard Shaw said, God created us in his image, and we decided to return the favor. And so sometimes you'll be talking, if you're sharing your faith, please have the courage. Don't put your light under a bushel to share the hope you have. We're not saying we're any better than anyone else. We're just better off because we've got hope and we're freed from guilt and shame. And we know where we're going. There's so many upsides to share with people. But often when I'm talking to someone, they'll say, well, for me, God is, the, or to me, God is, I say, that's exactly the problem because you're just creating 
I mean, I wouldn't speak it in that tone, but it's like, it's like, that is the problem, is that for me or to me, you're just crafting a God in your own image to endorse your own lifestyle choices, however you want to see how God is, to make him palatable to, palatable to you. So I get on an airplane, and come back from Burundi, and it's like a different planet here. And it's helpful to have, see God from uh, different perspectives and different cultures. But let's look at it in terms of, let's look at entertainment. The ent- entertainment industry, and, and a lot, we spend a lot of hours, don't we, in front of a, a screen of some description. You know that experiment with a frog in a pan of water? You put a frog in a boiling pan of water. By the way, this is, it, it actually isn't true, but it makes a really good illustration. <laughs> uh, you take a frog and put it on a boiling pan of water. It jumps out because it's boiling. But you take that same frog in the same pan, same hob, but cold water, you just put it in and slowly turn up by increments. It just sits there until it's cooked. That's the theory. You know, when I went to Burundi, I was to jump out of the pan. It was so surreal. So Couldn't possibly be lulled to sleep. But I come back here, it's so easy to get completely taken out. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. Can you hear it? Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, above all else. That's pretty high. Above all else, guard your heart because it's the wellspring of life. Above all else. And we don't guard our hearts in the main. So let's look practically. Let let me take reality shows as an example from our culture. And this one actually was a number of years ago, and it was Big Brother. And uh, I wrote this letter. So just substitute Love Island, whatever you want to substitute on this one. Uh, But this is a letter I wrote to my sister on Big Brother. I tried to sit watching with her, and I said, dear, dear sis, I love you. What may have started as a vaguely legitimate social experiment four years ago has descended into something so pathetically base, and it makes me absolutely gutted that you, who I love so much, get sucked into it and consider it entertainment. Now, don't put this down to my faith, although of course my faith defines my values. Put it rather down to my humanity. You see, I fear that you and the nearly 8 million people who watch Big Brother are losing your humanity because if you stick people in a cage and observe them operate as animals and indeed create an environment that is conducive to them behaving even more animalistically, then your voyeurism debases you as much as them. You become less human. And ratings were plummeting, so what did they do? They, they, they lowered the ceiling to make it more claustrophobic. They put a camera on them everywhere, it even went to the bog. I mean, come on. They got them all to sleep in one room with insufficient beds. They had met people, many very weird, picked on their ability to wind each other up. Mm, very wholesome. And I tried watching with you. I tried not judging. But I just couldn't stay. It made me feel all churned up inside. I wanted to cry. I wanted to scream at you and ask where you lost any, ab- any ability to discern what is legitimate amusement and what is sick. So I ask you, do you have any reservations about them flashing their tits and backsides, simulating oral sex, shaving their hairy butts, smearing memories with jam and getting others to lick it off, vomiting, wrestling topless in the mud, having sex under the table, constantly swearing and a whole lot more? Can you not see that you are victims of a tragically manipulative agenda of getting viewers at any cost to win the ratings war? Don't you think it's shameful? Don't you think it's wrong? Is there no such thing as right or wrong anymore? What do you make of that? As I unpack it, just the sort of things. Above all else, guard your heart. It's the wellspring of life. Would you like your wife to, would you like your sister, would you like, would I like my daughter to go on a show like that? Where she debases herself? And we debase ourselves as we endorse that product by watching it. Those precious lives. I'm not judging those. Love Island, I, I, well, I haven't seen anything, but you know, I remember maybe two, two years ago, it was on I, eight, eight, to me, eight seconds to be. <sighs> this is horrific. Those precious human beings, they are precious. We love. Loving Father, they're all children. Incidentally, the first ever Big Brother, this is beautiful irony for me in Burundi, the first ever Big Brother was won by a Scot called Callum in about is it 2001 or two or something. Some of you might remember it. He worked at the orphanage down the road from me in Burundi. And he came back from working. Some of you know the Grace story. He was with Grace at that orphanage. And he came back from Burundi, and he went on the show, and he won it. But the producers of Big Brother said, we will never, ever again have a Christian on the show because it was too wholesome. Because he was kind and winsome and funny 
and lovable, but it didn't win the ratings war. And we are so complicit in it. Please feel convicted. Because otherwise, when the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. Let's look at our culture. I'm not cherry-picking pet peeves at all. This is literally, if you look at the context of his Jesus sermon there, Sermon on the Mount, just a few verses later, verse 27, he says, You've heard it say, it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Oh, Jesus, tone it down. That's so extreme. And you listen, clearly, Jesus is the most polarizing person in history, most lovable encapsulating love, but people struggle with love on many levels. He wasn't trying to win a popularity contest. But, but listen, in these verses, he speaks of hell. He doesn't shy away from that. Our culture nowadays completely scorns and derides the concept and notion of hell as primitive and ridiculous. But no, the stakes are high. There will be a judgment. And the reality, again, from this sermon, from chapter 7, Jesus says, wide is the way and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many take that road, whereas narrow is the way and, and, and small is the gate that leads to life, and only a few find it. So he talks about hell, and he doesn't sugarcoat that. And, 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 and then he, he equates a lustful look with adultery, and flipping out, that's extreme, Jesus. Again, that's absurd. But what's he saying? What's he saying? Unpack it. Well, today, 4% apparently of people in England, 4% of people think that premarital sex, sex outside of marriage, before marriage, whatever, is wrong. Now, does that make the majority right? No, it doesn't. Well, Jesus and the rest of Scripture is clear that God, sex is an incredibly beautiful gift. It's a beautiful gift. It's a God-given gift. But the context is a lifelong union between a man and a woman in a covenant relationship that we call marriage. And that's a, that's a tough stance to even take nowadays in our culture, isn't it? So if you're in a relationship with someone right now, a sexual relationship with someone who's not your husband or wife, then, then Jesus has got pretty strong words to say. Ouch, that's a high standard. And the only way to accommodate and compromise is to lose our saltiness and hide our light. Now listen, Jesus said he's not a spoil sport. Again, he met, God made this fabulous gift. But this is fascinating to me. The Harvard sociologist, Professor P.A. Sorokin, in his book, America's Sex Revolution, he described the Russian attitude, the Bolsheviks, in the 1920s. I quote, The revolution leaders deliberately attempted to destroy marriage. That is what Marxism seeks to do. It wants highest allegiance to the state, and we are living in a cultural Marxist age right now, which you've got to be awake to. Which is about every institution to be captured by this thing, which is trying to push up, trying to break down family, and family is the bedrock of society. So the re revolution leaders deliberately attempted to destroy marriage and the family. The legal distinction between marriage and, the ca and casual sexual intercourse was abolished. Bigamy and polygamy were permissible under the new provisions. Abortion was facilitated in the state institutions. Premarital relations were praised. Extramarital relations were considered normal. Listen, within a few years, millions of lives, especially of young girls, were wrecked. The hatred and conflicts ma rapidly mounted, and so did psychoneurosis. Work in the national factories slackened. The government was forced to reverse its policy. So there was an atheistic regime going to God, trying to do a godless way of working society, and objectively it failed, so they had to backtrack because they were rejecting God's template, his beautiful, wise template. Are you salty? Are you shiny? There's so much confusion around this, isn't there? Our culture is utterly confused. We either can stand in love and resist that confusion together or, or, or cave and capitulate, and most of us seem to be capitulating. Because in our age of moral relativism, we've lost a consistent plumb line by which to define what is right and what is wrong. And so it, the ideas of, you know, in, in the realm of, of gender, uh, sexuality, identity politics, all these are massively important and delicate. And we need to listen well. We need to really listen well. We need to speak sensitively. We need to love consistently. With a love, by the way, that doesn't condemn. Again, chapter 7 here, it's God, God's place to judge. Do, Jesus says, do not judge, or you too will be judged, in chapter 7, a few verses later. 
But having said that, neither does it, does it mean we just, we're bullied by this cultural militant Marxist agenda into endorsing views that run completely counter to our scriptures. So a friend of mine is a school chaplain, and I had lunch with him a while back, and he'd got fired for, in a different context, out of the school context, expressing his belief on radio that uh, marriage was between a man and a woman. And because one of his kids at school heard that, reported back to school authorities, he was fired. And that's a very short version of a horrible story about what his family went through. Because he was called before the teacher, the head, head teacher, he said, you must actively pr pr promote this other agenda. And he said, I can't in good conscience do that. Now, you don't have to be... You know, that's, that's so extraordinary, isn't it? You don't have to be a follower of Jesus even to find that chilling if that's the consequence of not turning the line and eagerly adopting this creeping Orwellian groupthink. Down will come baby, cradle and all. So listen, we've considered salt. Now let's briefly look at the complementary analogy of light. Verse 14, Jesus tells his disciples, you are the light of the world. As salt, we're to counteract the power of sin. As light, our job is to make visible or illuminate, not with our own light, of course, but with Jesus' light. He said, I am the light of the world. We're, we're light bearers. So we reflect his glorious light to those around us, unashamedly, not putting it under a bowl, but rather on its stand to give light to everyone around us. Paul wrote in Philippians 2.15 that as believers, we are to shine among them like stars in the sky. Again, back to Yusuf. He says the Greek word used here is very similar to the word for the beacon that a lighthouse emits. And that beacon is bright and unmistakable in its purpose. It warns of danger. It directs a safe harbor. It provides hope for those who have lost hope. And every day, we, all of us, we're surrounded by people groping around in the darkness, separated from the God who loves them. Are you salty? Are you shiny? What's it look like for us in the workplace where values of greed or running roughshod over everyone else, profit being the bottom line, all that? What's it look like to be people of integrity? I think of my mate John, who's you know, 140 employees in the city. He's a, he's a founder, CEO. And uh, it's beautiful to have a good ending to the story. But for 10 years, he went to the city every day on the edge of vomiting with the pressure of maintaining his integrity. All the other companies in his very elite niche industry were watching him, knowing as a follower of Jesus, knowing that he could not succeed because he was, wasn't willing to, to compromise. And then just, I think, last, last year, the top contract in his industry, which Google, a few top, top, world top 10 names, were bidding for this contract. The guy said, no, we're using you because you are a man of integrity. A man had come up to him randomly on the street and prophesied over him, you are in the city to soak up corruption. Pff, that's a hard word to take, isn't it? And he's now come through with a 20-year uh, contract, uh, unbelievable mega bucks, which he will use for the kingdom. I mean, that's, it's good to hear those stories. But what's it look like for integrity or, or empowering people? You guys heading off to Kenya. My, my friend there, he's a, he's, Kenya, he's a coffee roaster in Burundi. He's now moved his operation to Kenya. But he's, playing, he's, playing, he's got about 5,000 coffee farmers working for him because he's paying double the wage because profit isn't the bottom line. It's actually lifting people out of poverty that is. You could take all sorts of different examples. You are in your, your sphere of influence. What does it look like to be salt and to be light? You know, there's such shallow materialism, pursuit of wealth, possessions, worship of celebrities. Let's see it for what it is. It's a satanic lullaby. And I contrast that with a man down the, down the road from me, who will be dead now. But my, my friend, I saw him in a refugee camp. He was praying. He had an empty bowl. He was in his rags. He was in the 80s. She went over, it just looked a bit anomalous, you know, what's he doing? So she went over and sat next to him. What's your story, old man? He told her he's in his 80s. He'd walked six days to get that refugee camp. He'd seen his wife and kids hacked to death and his house burnt down. So he had lost everything in the world. He was alone, nothing apart from that empty bowl and his stinking rags. But at the end of this horrific story of woe, he turned to her and he said, Madame Missionnaire, I never realized that Jesus was all I needed until Jesus was all I had. And what a rich man. I mean, he's dead now, but free. And I come back here and Bath, Cheltenham, loads of people. Got a lot, to with, a lot to live with and nothing to live for. And he's saying, I want to use you. And salt and light will mean recognizing people are more important than stuff. Amen? Because lots of you are prioritizing stuff over people. Relationships is what it's about. I love the African proverb. It says, if you want to go fast, go alone. 
you want to go far, go together. Interdependent in a very individualistic age. And Jesus, he looked at the crowd and he loved them in their lostness. And he wept over Jerusalem and he looked at the rich young ruler and he loved him. And he let him walk away sad. He didn't chase after him to soft pedal, tone down the message. He said, no, you've got to count the cost. And he loves us too much to tone it down. Too much to let us go on our merry way, oblivious to the consequences of losing our saltiness or sticking our light under a bowl. Listen, coming vaguely into land here. How can we remain salty and remain shiny? Well, Ivan Illich, who is an Austrian philosopher, he was actually asked, love this, whether it is more effective to change society through violent revolution or gradual reform. And he said, neither. If you want to change society, you must tell an alternative story. Well, I know there are lots of beautiful alternative stories being told through Trinity folk in different areas in Cheltenham and further, further overseas. But what, what, isn't it, what might an alternative story look like? Because that's what I want to tell. That's what we're telling in Burundi, loads of them but also in Bath. Well, it's one of hope, it's one of grace, it's one of forgiveness, it's one of sacrifice. You know, Jesus promised life in abundance, life to the full, John 10. So it's going to be a life well lived. If you take Galatians 5, where there's about nine fruit of the Spirit, let's look at that. So it's going to be a life of love instead of polemic, binary, hate-filled arguments. It's going to be one of joy instead of relentless pessimism, dark despair and negativity. It's going to be one of peace. Yes, deep shalom that passes understanding and stills us uh, despite challenging circumstances that we're going through. It's going to be one of patience in our frenetic, road rage, aggressive, sniping culture. It's going to be one of kindness instead of nastiness and malice and heartlessness. It's going to be one of goodness instead of cruelty and indecency. It'll be one of faithfulness instead of fickleness and disloyalty. It'll be one of gentleness instead of harshness. It'll be one of self-control instead of unconstraint and rashness. Remember Richard Werbrand? I mean, what a price he was willing to pay to remain uncompromised, to speak the truth, to hold the line. What about that Iranian sister? I mean, I don't know the rest of the story. Maybe she's in Evin prison right now for getting raped, separated from her husband and kids. Or maybe they had a team tour, and on the back of that discussion, they said, no, we're going to stay in Cheltenham. And we're going to tell an alternative story here. And it's going to be tough, and we're not going to fall asleep. And we're going to gather around us a bunch of people that are not being lulled to sleep. that are resisting intentionally that satanic lullaby. I don't know the end of the story. But we, guys, we can't settle for bumper stickers and slogans. I mean, he's calling us to scars. Amen? It's a tough word, isn't it? I think it's a word this nation needs, not just Trinity. But in closing, I'm, I'm going to pray a prayer. And um, why don't you stand just for a different posture, if you can. Don't have to. And uh, band guys, do you want to come up? But listen, um, this is a heavy, holy moment. And it's a, it's a, it's a different kind of prayer. And maybe it's a prayer that you can't pray. Some of us. So echo it in your hearts if you want to, but don't feel c- compelled because it's just it, the stakes are too high. We can't mess around. And it's a Franciscan prayer. Why don't you open your hands if you're up for that? Again, don't have to. This is just a posture of surrender. I look at my God gives where he finds empty hands. That's what St. Augustine said. God gives where he finds empty hands. And maybe it's hard for us to receive if our hands are, st- if our hands are stuffed full either physically or metaphorically. But they're, they're empty right now as I look at the palms of my hands as a position of humility, of surrender, of dependence, nakedness, really, before you, Lord. 
and I want to receive. And so may God bless you with discomfort. Discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, exploitation of people, so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done to bring justice and kindness to all our children and the poor. And so may God bless us and help us to be salty and shiny. And if the salt, saltiness has been lost and the light has faded, may he restore you this morning. May he restore us so that we are truly salty again. Our light shines gloriously again, all for the first time. As the verse says, before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. Keep pressing in. Chance just to respond as we sing, but just press on in. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Come, Holy Spirit.